Hello, can everyone hear? All right, good morning, everyone. Um, first off, thank you all for you brave people coming out through the traffic in the rain first thing on a Monday morning. Really appreciate y'all being here. Uh, my name is Laura Manley and I'm the executive director of the Shorenstein Center on Media, Politics and Public Policy. I am just thrilled to be here with this esteemed panel to talk about the importance of building trust in government. So I'm just gonna kick it right off and go right into bios so we can have this interesting conversation. Um, first to my left, we have Robin Carnahan. Robin is currently serving as the administrator of the US General Services Administration. As administrator, she's working to empower GSA career professionals and build on the agency's efforts to deliver the best value in real estate, acquisition, and technology services to the government and American people. Prior to joining GSA, Carnahan served in executive and leadership roles in business, academia, and government, including as the Secretary of State of Missouri, and founded and led the state and local government practice at 18F, a tech consultancy inside GSA. She is nationally recognized government technology leader and in 2017 was named as one of the federal government's top women in tech. Most recently, Carnahan was a fellow at Georgetown University's Beak Center where she co-founded the State Software Collaborative. As Secretary of State, Carnahan also served as a state election official and state securities regulator and was responsible for providing in-person and online services to hundreds of thousands of customers. Central was leading the office's tech modernizations efforts across seven operating divisions. She frequently speaks, writes, and testifies about government innovation through smarter use of technology. Next, we have Chris Kwong. Chris is a co-founder of the U.S. Digital Corps, a two-year federal government program recruiting early career technologists to contribute to high-impact efforts, including in public health, cybersecurity, and streamlining government services. The Digital Corps was launched in 2021 by the Biden-Harris administration and operates out of the U.S. General Services Administration. Prior to the Digital Corps, Chris co-founded and led the nonprofit Coding It Forward, placed hundreds of tech students in meaningful public service experiences in federal, state, and local government agencies. He graduated from Harvard College and previously worked as an RA for the Technology and Public Purpose Project at Harvard Kennedy School, where he co-authored a report and did an amazing job testifying and working on tech capacity in Congress. And lastly, we have Nick Sinai, who is a venture capitalist, author, and former US deputy CTO in the Obama White House. At Harvard Kennedy School, Nick is a senior fellow at the Belfer Center and previously was the inaugural re recipient of the Walter Shorenstein Media and Democracy Fellowship. Nick also served as adjunct lecturer in public policy. Starting in 2016, Nick designed and taught an award-winning field course, Tech and Innovation in Government, and more recently taught Policy de Design and Delivery. Nick is a senior advisor at Insight Partners and serves on the board of Shift5, Hawkeye 360, Rebellion Defense, and Leo Labs. Nick also serves as commissioner on the Atlantic Council's Commission on Defense, Innovation, and Adoption. In the White House, OSTP from 2010 to 2014, Nick led President Obama's Open Data Initiative, co-led initiative, and helped start the Presidential Innovation Fellowships. And then lastly... Nick is also the co-author with Marina Nitza of Hack Your Bureaucracy, Go Out and Get It, Get Things Done No Matter What Your Role on Any Team Is, published last year. So can I just get a round of applause for this panel here? Okay, so first off, for many of you that don't know GSA, I'm just gonna turn it over to Robin quickly to tell us a little bit more about that and their role in building trust in government. Well, thank you. And again, thanks to everybody who came out this morning in the rain. Uh, appreciate you being here. So GSA, not a thing most people know about. I will tell you, I didn't as a young person or somebody coming out of college aspire to run GSA. I didn't even know what it was. But it turns out it is this really important moment, which is basically in charge of delivery. If you think about governments, all of, a lot of it's about policy, but policy is often sunk by bad delivery. And so back in the Truman administration, they decided to consolidate a lot of the sort of delivery functions of government at GSA. And so we're in charge of real estate, which means the biggest real estate portfolio in the country. We're in charge of buying stuff, which means we buy about $100 billion worth of goods and services for agency partners. And we're in charge of technology which I will tell you is the thing that attracted me to GSA. 
because I understand that government is basically a service delivery business. I really understood that when I was secretary of state because people would come in and want to interact with government in a way. And, you know, they didn't want to fiddle around. They had a thing that they needed and expected results. In the olden days, they used to say, if you couldn't uh, plow the snow when it, when it, you know, snowed, that you didn't deserve to be mayor. I don't know if anybody remembers that there was actually a mayor in Chicago who lost an election over not getting the snow plowed one time. I kind of feel like that's the case with government service delivery now when it comes to digital things. And so I often talk about making the damn websites work, being the, sort of the foundational thing that we have to do in government now. And for me, that's what the trust circle is all about, right? Because as citizens, we give up some liberty, we pay some money, and we expect some services in return for that. And nowadays we expect those services to be digital like they are in the rest of our lives. And so that's why it's so important. And that's why the role of GSA as the one who's in charge of what we call shared services um, is so important. And that's why we're always recruiting technologists. So in 2021, the president signed the Transforming Federal Customer Experience and Service Delivery to Rebuild Trust in Government Act. What the executive order? So why is that important? And what does that mean for GSA? Yeah, that's a long name. Um, so, but let me just say, it is really cool to have things that you've been working on for a long time, things you've talked about for a long time, and those words come out of the mouth of the president, right? And he signed an executive order in his first year about customer experience. And I will tell you that, you know, all of us who've been thinking about this digital government and government service delivery for a long time understand that that experience, that interaction that you have with government is either going to make you trust it if it's good or not trust it if it's bad. And so all of this to me foundationally is about trust and every interaction that you have. And if it's a delightful, easy thing uh, that that builds trust and everyone that isn't diminishes that trust. And so the fact that the president understands how important this is and how important delivery is uh, to his entire agenda, and frankly, this is about trust in our government. This is about trust in democracy, right? And democracy's ability to deliver for people. So uh, it's really foundational and it's great that the, that the president uh, gets it and talks about it a lot. Okay, so now that we have the overview and this recent executive order, I'd love to hear more about how you all got to this place. How, what brought you to public service and why tech of all of the things that you could be focused on? Why government, why tech? And so we'll start with Rob and then we'll go down the line. Yeah, I feel like I've done all the talking. You guys got a lot of interesting stories to tell. Um, so I come from a family that's been involved in public service uh, a lot over the years. And so myself, I've been sort of in and out of public service in the private sector. Um, and I've always thought that there's no bigger way to make an impact on your community. Full stop. I mean, you know, we're here on this earth for not that long. We can choose to do things that are bigger than ourselves and help our community and leave this place better than we arrived or not, right? And government is the single biggest, most impactful place you can go to make a difference in your community, just is. And so that's a thing that I grew up thinking. That's a thing that I have seen throughout my life. Um, and when you go into government, when it comes to technology, <laughs> you see that there, it is a opportunity rich environment for people who understand how to translate technology into good service for citizens. Um, I will tell you just a really quick little story. When I first became secretary of state, uh, I, my first day I walked in and there were more people like literally opening envelopes and preparing checks to be deposited for their business registrations than we had in the whole IT department. And I thought, oh my, we have got a long way to go. But after eight years, didn't take all that long, but 
we transitioned all of that. We transitioned so people didn't have to send in those checks anymore. And those people that were doing the work didn't have to do that work anymore because we, we were able to have all of this automated and have people able to do it online, which meant they got, they could do it 24 hours a day. They didn't have to show up. They had, you know, confirmation of what happened, like everything about the transaction. We know how, what that means. It all made it easier. And there are lots of opportunities in government to do that, to provide better service and to do it better for taxpayers. But it takes sort of people being creative and innovative uh, to get that done. I think for, and first, thank you, Laura, for, for having us, but really exciting for me, I think, to reflect on my public service journey, because in a lot of senses, it started right here as a student with a very similar orientation that you described, which is recognizing, realizing that government is probably the best way that we have to make a difference on a large scale for people and communities, not just your own, but across the country. And I was in school around the time of the 2016 election, which uh, was obviously very contentious, but I think for the first time brought to a lot of people's mind the role of technology in our society as well. Uh, we were contemplating things like fake news or misinformation perhaps for the first time and what these big technology platforms and tools would have an impact on our democracy. And I think I'd been very interested in technology for a long time very interested in public service for a long time and had never really seen an opportunity to combine those two things in any really tangible way. And it wasn't until I took Nick's class and met Laura shortly thereafter that I saw for the first time that there was a world at the intersection of technology and public service, which was definitely a light bulb moment for me. Groups that were focused on delivering, making it easier for veterans to get access to their benefits for disaster survivors to get loans for to rebuild their homes and their businesses and to be able to do that through technology and not have to send in checks and wait in the mail and hope that things would play out on the back end. And for me, the decision was, hey, do I go perhaps to work at a tech company and spend all my time changing the color of a button, rounding it out? all to advance perhaps a profit mode of getting someone to click this ad a little bit more, serve these results just a millisecond faster? Or could we bring those same skill sets into government and opportunity-rich environment, help people really understand that these skills could really have a, a fundamental impact? And so that was what set me on my path in, in serving government. I think the opportunities were, were just endless and at that point, there still weren't a ton of technologists in government. And so the opportunity to jump right in and take on perhaps a more hands-on role was greater than joining an organization where there are already thousands of software engineers. The marginal impact of adding an engineer, a product manager, a designer just felt a lot higher. So I think that was what catapulted me towards public service. It started with an organization called Coding It Forward, which brought uh, software engineers, data scientists, and the government for 10-week internships. And that ended up proving a lot that young people, students could actually have a meaningful impact where the original operating hypothesis was you had to be 10, 15 years into your career, perhaps as an engineer before you came back into government. And we showed that, hey, you might be two years into college, you have just as much to bring and just as much to contribute. And so uh, from there, we were able to come to GSA in 2021 and, and kick off the U.S. Digital Corps, and I'm sure we'll talk more about that. But I think being in a school of government here and attending so many talks at the Harvard Kennedy School, so much was this conversation about policy. And, and the goal was, let's get this bill signed or let's get this passed through Congress. And people saw that as the finish line. When I think for a lot of us, we see that as a starting line of now we actually got to do the hard work to make everything that's on paper exist for people in real life. And that was a challenge that was exciting to me back then. It's a challenge that I'm still excited about now in, in the work that we do. Great. Thanks for having me. This is so much fun and, and a bit of a, a, a homecoming or a round trip here, uh, especially for, for Chris. Uh, so. 
you know, relevant to the Shorenstein Center, I actually grew up with a lot of newspapers. I don't come from a newspaper family, but we subscribe to the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the San Francisco Chronicle, and the Berkeley Voice. I grew up in, in, in Berkeley, California. And so I just remember reading a lot about public service, about the federal government, and, and was inspired. And when I was an undergraduate here, I took Roger Porter's class, was inspired uh, to kind of go into government. I was actually a, an intern in, in the Clinton uh, White House, um, and I knew I wanted to serve in some capacity. And it wasn't until I was on my honeymoon, um, I opened up the newspaper and the first day it says Lehman Brothers goes bust. The only problem was I was currently working at Lehman Brothers uh, Venture Partners. And so I said, you know, honey, let's enjoy the honeymoon and we'll figure this out when we get back. And decided uh, quite naively when I came back that I was going to just go get a job in the Obama administration, not realizing like how hard that was or just... I was just going to move, move to DC and uh, go get a job. And, you know, with a, a little bit of elbow grease and a lot of nose, uh, I eventually got hired at the FCC and then uh, got hired into the Obama uh, um, Office of Science and Technology Policy in, in the Obama White House. And it was just so awesome uh, to work with so many talented professionals who were determined to have such a massive public impact. Um, and, and for me, I, I had been investing and in consulting, uh, in technology companies and helping, helping technologists for pursuit of profit. And it was really great to see, you know, what was the role of LG, uh, inside of government. And, uh, we saw very vividly in, in 2013 when technology, uh, basically was the reason that the president's signature domestic accomplishment was torpedoed with with the failure of healthcare.gov. And that really inspired President Obama and woke up the West Wing. And candidly, it woke up the, the Obama administration to the power of technology. You know, we had been talking about it. We had been putting out various policies, but I think you saw a, a newfound uh, um, appreciation for just how important uh, delivery and, and digital delivery uh, was. And so, uh, it, it was really great to try and bring some additional capacity to it initially with the presidential innovation fellows as mid-career technologists and entrepreneurs into, into government. GSA create, created uh, a whole uh, uh, portion of, of GSA to focus on, on technology, uh, and the White House created the U.S. Digital Service. So you saw all of these great things, but you didn't really have the uh, early career tech talent coming in. And I'm glad we have uh, entrepreneurs like Chris who are, who are focused on it. So I'd, I'd like to actually, I'm gonna catch you off guard. The first time I met Nick was about 10 years ago. We were talking about blueberries. Do you remember this? So no. we, <laughs> because you were giving a talk at Department of Commerce about the value of open data and you talked about the story of when you make government data available to build trust, then farmers can have access to this information, understand weather patterns better, have more successful crops, and then just do better for themselves and their families and their communities with Climate Corp. And that's when we first were talking about open data. And so I, I like to bring that up because it's, it's such a valuable way to talk about what trust means at its most fundamental level, which is which is data. And that's actually how I came to this space and why I care about this topic so much. I actually started in mental health a long time ago. And increasingly there were more and more apps and digital services available for people dealing with, with mental health and mental illness. And uh, there were a lot of questions around privacy and making that data available and who should have access to it. And when I started looking into digital privacy rights, it was really concerning. And that's how I got working in open data. And it started with the question of trust for me. Who should have this information? And what does trust really mean for me? And what do I feel comfortable with? So when you reflect back on building trust in government, what, what does that really mean for you? How do, how do you think about trust and not just, you know, the platitudes around how trust is important for democracy, but like, what does it specifically mean for you? There, are, I think trust is is a very personal thing. 
kind of depends on where you are in your life. Uh, for people that are recovering from a disaster or need to turn to government at a time of need, and we all saw it during the pandemic, it's pretty foundational, right? That trust is about government responding to my need at that moment. And that's why you hear us talk about delivery all the time, because that's the thing that has that compact between you and the government. For folks that aren't in the middle of a giant stress, I think they have a lot more luxury, frankly, to have trust be about other things, right? But foundationally for the government, we're different than companies in that it's our job to make sure that people's privacy is protected. It's our job to serve everybody. Companies get to pick their customers, but it's government's job to serve everybody. So access and equity really, really matters. And then there's this overlay of security that we are seeing increasingly um, under threat. And so to me, when I think about trust and how do we build that is you have to actually prove that out every day in interactions that you have. And frankly, it's pretty hard, right? Um, but at the end of the day, you, you, you've got to, this is government's job, right? Is, is to deliver these things that, that people need. Um, and if you deliver, I think you build trust. One other element that I reflect a lot on when it comes to trust, I think is not only responsiveness, are we responding to your needs, but the representation element of it. How well do you see yourself reflected in the work of government? And that can go a couple of different ways, right? It could be simply who is in our government. And when we talk about the United States Digital Corps, one of our mantras is how do we recruit a class of technologists that reflects the people that we serve, right? Because we know that having multiple perspectives at the table means that we're better, better able to represent different life experiences and needs of people across the country. And it's not just race, gender, ethnicity, but we think about geography, we think about age and lived experience and, and educational background and making sure that we not only have folks who are graduating from schools like Harvard, but we have career changers, we have people who have served in the military. And I think that builds trust in a really powerful way when you can see people that look like you who are doing the work of the government, because ultimately government is just who shows up and we want to make sure that everyone is able to do that. And I think that's one way that we can represent the public that we serve. And another that we talk a lot about is this notion, this practice of human centered design. How can we improve the UX, the user experience, the customer experience of government, right? And it's not a foreign concept in the private sector to talk to the people that are going to use your product. The people who are using your app, observe them out in the wild to see what works, what doesn't work. How can we make this process faster, streamline it, improve the user experience? And that's something that a lot of our teams have been really focused on is empowering folks in government to be able to go out and get that feedback to make applying for a loan or filing for bankruptcy, whatever it might be, just a little bit easier. We're used to ordering packages or food and having that be straightforward to the point where you can do it accidentally because everything is just so easy. Whereas it feels like pulling teeth sometimes when you're trying to engage with something that the public sector is responsible for. And so by making it easy, um, again, people often interact with government when things aren't going so well. And so to have that experience be even more challenging and painful can be a really difficult point when it comes to trust. And so making sure that we reflect the people that we serve and we also reflect how they interact with our products. We talk a lot about technology. Uh, technology, obviously access is not super equitable across the country either. And so we are not also just a one-stop shop. We can't pick our customers and say, hey, if you don't have internet access, 
after you're out, out use these websites, we have call centers, we have other ways that folks can continue to get the services that, and it goes with accessibility and making sure that we're 508 compliant uh, for folks who might be using screen readers or other assistive technologies as well. And so I think trust is making sure that we see everyone and that everyone sees that we see them in how we design our work. Maybe just quickly building on, on their comments is trust is is uh, not only personal but can be heterogeneous, right? So you can you can have a, a relationship with your VA doctor uh, and and trust them with your life and and all of your information and ha have a meaningful bond and then have a negative interaction somewhere else with another part of government. And so uh, you know how we trust government may depend on on the agency. And in fact, it makes me think of that old line, get your government hands off my Medicare, right? You know, um, the American people have different conceptions of the federal government and different trust levels, but it's not one government that they necessarily, they may have a different conception of different parts of government or the military and so forth. And so I think it's just, you know, we have to be thinking about how do we continue to build trust day in and day out because it's, once broken, it's very hard to regain that trust. So I'd love to hear a, a couple examples of, of how we're seeing trust manifest in, in specific examples. I mean, some of the things that we're talking about are the general kinds of approaches that we're taking for service delivery, but what are some of the examples that people might be familiar with where they've developed this go? Well, I, I, one example I'd like to just flag, because. Part, part of what I talk about all the time is the wheel. So if you think about a, a citizen government interaction from a technology point of view, it's pretty similar, right? From one agency to the next. So you have to have some kind of a secure way to sign on. You have to have a way to check eligibility. You have to be able to securely get information passed back and forth. There might be money involved. There might be um, uh, other kinds of like oversight and auditing. So like from a technical point of view, there's a lot of similarities. And so one of the things we try to do, uh, figure out where those patterns are and then build some shared services around those. So not every agency has to go reinvent the wheel and pay for that over and over again. So um, a few examples. One, we have a thing called login.gov. Uh, and that is a single sign-on for interacting with government. And if you think about it, <laughs> I, I don't know about you, but keeping track of all these crazy different logins is a real pain in my world. Um, and if you could, if you could imagine somebody having to interact with government, that's a, that would be a thing. Like whether you wanted to get your, you know, child welfare benefits or something in housing or maybe a student loan or whatever it is, to not have to do this over and over again. So that is that is one area very specifically that we're trying to make it easier. There's another uh, that's a really great example of a shared service. It's called the US Web Design Standards. Sounds kind of boring, but it turns out I'm a, I'm a giant fan of content design and other kinds of design in these interactions because I actually think 80% of our problems in government could get solved if it was written in plain language and designed well, right? But we don't have a lot of those people in government, so we're always recruiting for them. But the web design standards basically lay out what it would take to have a, a 508 compliant website, an accessible website that's required by law, but not everybody does it, uh, and th that is basically open source and you can re you can use or you can hand to your vendor and say whatever you build out, have it look like this, have it be this font size, have it look, have this layout. It turns out this thing that we've invested, I don't know, maybe a million dollars in over the years, like it's not a ton of money from government speak, is used today, has a billion page views per month. And that was just somebody who said, you know what, why do we, why does everybody have to do this over and over again? Why don't we just make it easy for government agencies to do the right thing here? And so we love that. And so what we're trying to do is figure out similar situations. We have a thing called um, uh, USA.gov. We have USA.gov in Espanol. We have a thing called Vote.gov. And these are services where there are things that people specifically like Google or try to figure out. 
And if we have an official government website that makes it easy to send them to, to the right place, then to me, that's a way to build trust. Continuing on the theme of federal websites, we talk about the web design system. You've probably all been to numerous government websites and some of them look like they were built yesterday and they were great. Some of them look like they were built uh, a little before yesterday and, and maybe a little bit dated. And so the web design system, basically plug and play from a technical perspective, all of the components, all of the fonts, all of the colors, everything is open source. It is all on GitHub. You could use it if you're the Department of Health and Human Services. You could use it if you're the Department of Defense. And it's not something that you have to create from scratch. Can you talk a little bit, what is open source and what is GitHub? Yes, yes, of course. And I will admit before I go into the weeds that despite leading a thing called the US Digital Core and prior to that, coding it forward, I am not a tech person. So Perfectly. High forgive level. me, high, high level. level. High level, what that means is all of the code behind the website is available online. You could copy and paste it, control F for HHS and replace that with the State Department. It is not something that we pay for. We built a website that the code is proprietary and someone else can't use it. We're all on the same team in government. And if we build it once, there's no reason that if your problem is 90% the same, why you shouldn't be able to use that as a stepping stone, as a foundation to accomplish what you want. And so everything on GitHub, it's a platform for collaborating on, on code and, and being able to post your, your information online in an open access manner. I think that is super important. And so the web design systems is one thing that uh, we're able to support other agencies on. Uh, the US Digital Core, I mentioned a little bit early on, but the premise for us is we're a two-year fellowship for folks who are coming out of school, either an undergraduate or graduate degree with engineering, with data science, design, cybersecurity skills to serve the public. We have folks working on USA.gov and vote.gov. And we actually have some fellows who are at the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. You may have heard it as CISA, America's Cyber Agency. They're responsible for election defense, election security, but also supporting state, local, tribal, and territorial governments with their cybersecurity posture. So kind of breaking out of kind of the federalism lens, also critical infrastructure partners, power plants, and, and the like. And they run a really cool program that GSA used to have a part in called the .gov program, which helps all government entities at all levels be able to move their websites onto a website that ends in .gov. So I don't actually know what Cambridge, Massachusetts is, but it could be, it's a .gov, so they know what they're doing. Um, it might be cambridgema.gov, but there's still so many governments across that are .org, .com, .whatever it might be. And when you're someone that is looking to pay a parking ticket or or to a rent check or whatever it might be, knowing that you can trust the information because it's coming from a .gov website, it's coming from a website that's using the US web design system because it makes it easy, goes a long way to trust. Because otherwise, when you Google something, you, you have a lot of people who make a lot of money by impersonating government services and websites. So getting folks onto a .gov is a huge way to build trust. I want, to, I want to just flag one of the things you were talking about, this notion that if you, you the taxpayers pay for a thing one time, that the taxpayers ought to own it, is in government. Because we tend to have the taxpayers pay for the same thing over and over again. And, I, and what he's talking about with these open source and shared tools is basically taxpayers pay for it once, taxpayers own it, we get to share it in whatever way we want. It just makes so much sense because it's better service for people and saves money. Yeah, hey, we, we talk about investment in, in technology paying off and in, in cost avoidance. And one other part of GSA that you probably can speak a lot better to than I can, but is very novel in government is what we call the Technology Modernization Fund or, or TMF. And it's basically an investment vehicle where agencies say, hey, we have this big meaty tech issue that if we solve it this way, will save us a whole lot of money down the road. We're doing it smarter and it got a billion dollars in a pandemic kind of legislation. And we've been able to support agencies across government in their modernization journeys. 
mention comes up time and again is how can we support agencies in that manner? One more quick example would be covidtests.gov. And so this is an example of the federal government um, responding to, to the need of, of Americans needing tests and, and rather than reinventing the wheel, working with the postal service, USPS, uh, to deliver um, testing to, to whoever requested it. And that's a website that, that was uh, uh, built in a very short time frame and that was you know, designed with best, best practices of user-centered design, so it was incredibly simple. Uh, and everybody uh, could use it, and it worked, and, and, and the test got uh, delivered. And so I think that was a great contrast to the you know, healthcare.gov uh, kind of example. There was a lot of PTSD, as you can imagine, as that thing was getting stood up with people who lived through healthcare.gov who were like, we're not doing that again. I got one vignette I want to tell about that. Um, so how many people here got tests through that? I mean, I definitely did. So, so, uh, when this was being rolled out, they decided not to have, have low out everybody show up on the first day, but one of the best practices is you kind of roll it out slowly, make sure it works. And so, uh, I knew it was coming and I called my mother who at the time was 89. And I said, mom, you need to go to this website and get your COVID test delivered. And she said what you would expect, which is, oh, can't you do that for me? You know, it's going to be hard. And I said, no, 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 really just, it's not hard. Go there. Let me know how it went. I kid you not 90 seconds later, she calls me back and she says, wow, that was a well-designed website. That was so easy. It took me no time to get this. And then she puts the zinger in, which is, are you going to make all the government websites work that well? Right? So the story of that was it didn't break. It worked. It was a thing that was like, to me, through the whole pandemic of all the things that were a mess, it was the most tangible thing people got out of government. Like they were able to go to a website and get a test delivered to their house. And I'm like, bravo team. That's what we need to keep doing. I don't know if I'm more impressed with your 90 year old mom knowing how to turn on a computer and get to a website or the website. That's very impressive. Okay. All right. So I want to give Chris just a couple of minutes to talk about US Digital Core. And then I want to open it up to any questions that folks have. Do you want to tell a little bit about Digital Core and how people can get involved? Yeah, I would love to. One of our mantras is you're always recruiting. And, and so it wouldn't be a, a GSA event if we didn't throw in a pitch. But the Digital Core mentioned it's a two-year program for folks who are coming out of school. It could be anywhere from an associate's degree to a PhD. And so kind of very liberal interpretation of what a recent graduate is. But I think being in school, for me, at a place like Harvard, you saw a lot of folks who are studying government or who are studying uh, political science, whatever it might be, law, all aspire to work uh, and serve the public, right? You want to intern on Capitol Hill, you want to clerk for a judge. But if you're studying computer science, that notion of, hey, I want to serve the public, that same sentiment never existed. And I think a big part of that was it wasn't clear what opportunities existed if you wanted to be a software engineer, but you also wanted to serve the public, or if you were a designer and you wanted to serve the public. And the digital core, I hope, is now kind of can be an opportunity for folks. And so about two years ago, we launched the program. We hire in five broad tracks. And so that's software engineering, data science, and analytics. So if anyone's hearing anything about artificial intelligence in the world, we're doing a lot of that here in government as well. Product management, design, and cybersecurity. And for two years, you have a base in kind of the GSA. You come in as part of a cohort in the community. So you've got your people. We actually have some of our fellows out in the crowd who are in the Boston area, which is awesome. And one of the huge perks is that you can work from anywhere um, across the country. So if you've got a home base, you've got community, family, and you want to be here in Boston, you don't all have to, to move down to Washington, D.C. You spend two years working on a high-impact project at an agency. And so to date, we have just shy of 90 fellows working across 19 or 20 agencies, everything from helping the Centers for Disease Control uh, really stand up their pandemic 
analytics and, and forecasting practice to helping uh, make sure that we are tracking and, and supporting un, unaccompanied minors at our southern border and making sure that them with um, sponsors, caregivers here in the U.S. to supporting the cybersecurity of every American consulate and embassy overseas. Uh, one of our fellows has racked up probably a ton of frequent flyer miles. He's traveled everywhere, uh, Brussels to Equatorial Guinea and the such to ensure that our American diplomats are able to work securely. So there's a lot of good work and you come in with a cohort to do that. And so we typically recruit once a year in the fall semester. So coming up in hopefully the next few weeks, if we get everything to go smoothly and you start the program in the summer months, July or August, and you have an orientation, bring folks to DC a couple of times a year and it's really fantastic work. And um, sounds like you can make... I say we have an ulterior motive, which Always. is once you once you're there for two years, we hope that you are on the impact that you can make in government. And so there are lots of other opportunities to to continue your career. Yeah, definitely. We've built in an accelerated career path. So you get promoted faster than most federal employees. If you're interested in these days, this concept I think is at the front of so many people's minds. And I like to say that there's almost nothing more secure than a job in the federal government. The, the work goes on. And so our fellows are super fantastic. And I don't know, Laura, maybe if we have some time after questions, um, not to put Kathleen UNSB on the spot a little bit, but oh, that's okay. Well, Robin's the boss. So um, we, we in, in some senses get paid to talk about how, how great the work is, but um, Kathleen or SB, if I can maybe just hand you the microphone, introduce, love if you could introduce kind of your background before coming into the digital core and kind of just a little bit about um, the, the work that you're doing. Two different agencies, two really different sets of projects. And uh, Hi everyone, I'm Kathleen Carroll. Um, I'm from Dorchester, Massachusetts, just on the other side of the red line. So happy to be here today. Um, I graduated from uh, my master's in civic media design at Emerson College um, into the pandemic world, really interested in how can I use design skills um, to improve services for um, the people who are affected by the pandemic, especially in my own community. So I worked in local public health for a few years before landing in the digital core at um, Health is where I work in the office of the Assistant Secretary for Health. Um, and one of the projects that I worked on was the Health Plus Long COVID report, which is a human-centered design report that takes over um, a thousand hours of qualitative research, like interviews and workshops with people who are affected by long COVID um, and kind of synthesizes all of that information into opportunity areas that we can, you know, improve those services, take that patient journey from um, being diagnosed with long COVID from something that's really complex and uh, for most people into something that is streamlined and a, there's a clear path forward. Um, so yes, that's one of the um, projects that I've been able to work on and we're looking at how to um, kind of operationalize that and make that a reality now. Um, so that's been really impactful and um, thanks for inviting us to speak, Chris. No, thank you. Thank you for sharing. Kathleen mentioned that report, the Health Plus Long COVID report. It, it's won a couple of awards and I mean, everyone's heard of long COVID and you have just a chorus of epidemiologists, scientists, physicians saying this is long COVID, that is long COVID. But kind of that the group of voices that was missing from that discourse were the people who actually had long COVID. And, and so this notion that the federal government in the office of the assistant secretary for health would actually go out and talk to folks who were living through that with that experience and understanding that journey and being able to center and highlight their voices in illustrating what kind of public health response and what kind of opportunities that we had to support these. Really, when we talk about human-centered design and building trust and making sure that folks' needs are met by their government, it's not just the websites, it's not just in the technology, it, it can inform and uh, illustrate our, our public health and policy responses as well. So Kathleen, Thank you for that work, uh, first and foremost, and, and for being here. 
And SB, I know you're just a few months into your journey here. So, um, but you're working on a really cool team and love for you to share a little bit more about that too. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Aspi. I use she, her pronouns, and I am repping Western Massachusetts. Um, I went to Smith College and I studied uh, urban rural planning and community design. And then from there, I went to work at Dartmouth College, helping build their service design program, which paired student designers with organizations on campus that were offering services, but didn't actually know what students needed from those services. Um, and after my time at Dartmouth, I was really interested in going back into my government work. Um, I've been working at the local government level and I was wondering if I could do that at a higher level um, and was really excited to find this fellowship. And as Chris said, I am a in the second cohort. So I started in July. I'm also in the design track um, and I am working at a really, really cool organization under GSA um, called 10X which is, yeah. <laughs> um, and basically their offer is, think of like a Shark Tank meets um, Venture Studio meets um, a group of really interesting people, thank you, <laughs> who are looking to improve the services that government offers the public through really small incremental testing. And so I'm working on a design team that takes ideas that are pitched to them and tests out at a very small level, is this possible? Could this have a high impact? Um, who would be affected and in what ways? And we have four phases of research and design and discovery. Um, so instead of spending five years rolling out some sort of program, we can test out on like a couple year or a couple month cycle if it's a good idea or not. Um, and so like an, a, an example of a different way of thinking about trust in government is they have this really cool pitch where information in government is often siloed because of security purposes between agencies. And one pitch that came to 10X is what if there was a digital passport that every community member in the US had where they could hold their own data and plug it in when they're trying to get services and see who visits their data within the government. Um, and so that's just one example of different pitches that come to 10X and are being investigated. Prove that out instead of writing a contract, putting tens of millions of dollars in and waiting seven years and maybe the need is shifted. The 10X sprints and phases work in a really a matter of weeks and months and, and not years and, and decades. And the other cool thing about 10X is all of those pitches come from other federal employees. So we have over 2 million federal employees and this notion of technology and government, sometimes people think we need tech people from the outside to come in and solve our problems. And I think anything could be further from the truth than that. It's in reality, the people that have been doing this work for years or decades, even these civil servants, they know probably better than anyone where the opportunities are in 10X is a perfect vehicle. And I'm pretty sure either the web design system or and or login.gov, maybe both, were 10X projects. So someone had that idea and it got proved out. And now these are systems that are widely used across government. So thanks, SB, for sharing and for, for that work. And I'm going to hand this back to Laura. Okay, so we've got time for one or two questions. Does anyone have a question? And please keep them questions, ending with an actual question. So I think we've got someone in the back, we've got someone right in the front, and then someone in the corner. There you go. Uh, probably a very basic question. These opportunities are reserved to uh, permanent residents or American citizens, is that right? So for most opportunities in the federal government, unfortunately, you do have to be a US citizen or a national, and that is residents of American Samoa or Swains Island. Um, but if you're a permanent resident eligible to work in the US, unfortunately in the federal government, we have pretty tight citizenship requirements. But I would say so much of this work is also happening at a state level, at the local level, the folks in Boston, in Massachusetts. And if you look at those levels, it's a lot closer to where the rubber meets the road sometimes. It's who's plowing the snow, who's um, clearing the roads and they often might have residency requirements so that you got to live in the place where you're working, but you don't necessarily have to be a US citizen. So at the federal level, I think the answer is unfortunately you have to be a citizen, 
but this work now compared to five, 10 years ago, you see it in so many different places. And so I would encourage you to look there um, for anyone who's not a citizen. Yeah, I would say uh, there is a citizenship requirement for feds, most state and locals not. Um, and a lot of them have similar digital teams. And just to add there, opportunities to get into this type of work in civil society and academic organizations that partner many times with government agencies. So it's not just government or bust. Okay, so we had someone here in the front. Hi. Yeah, you. thank you so much. This has been awesome. I'm curious about the adoption of these different shared services and technology advances specifically like, well, for example, I work in the private sector right now, and there are definitely different domains and industries that are resistant to human-centered design, UX things, you know, they see things more traditionally. So I'm curious how agencies have been responding to these advancements and uh, what that's been like and how things are communicated to them in order to help them see the value. Such a good question. Yeah. <laughs> it all boils, I'm going to go off on procurement for a minute, if that's okay. Um, okay, so procurement is like this crazy word that makes everybody want to reach for their telephones and not pay attention. But I, will, I have this great, great story about a guy who was a technologist in San Francisco and he came to work for the government and he's in his first few months in government. And he's like, why does everybody talk so much about procurement? And after a couple of months, he says, procurement's really important. And a few months later, he says, there is nothing more important than getting procurement right. And why do I say this to your question? In the end, knowing what to buy, like companies that do work with the government, we always partner with companies. You can't bring enough technologists in the government to do all the work. It's always a partnership with companies. But if you don't know what you want to buy, you're definitely not going to get it, right? And you're going to get whatever has been done in the past. So part of what this is all about when we're talking about bringing technologists in is about helping inform the procurement that is the services that we're going to buy and bring into the government. And so the folks that are resistant are going to be the ones that tend to be the legacy providers that know how this has worked for decades. And that's they have teams that are ready to do that. Um, now we're in a place where we want different kinds of approaches. We want more agile approaches. We want more uh, human-centered design approaches than a document together that says every single thing that you're going to do. And then if you change that, there's a change order that costs you more money. So I'll stop at this, but I can go on this topic for a really, really long time. It's big and important. Um, well, thank you all for being here. Uh, sounds like sort of the one natural extension of trust in government is that it's the best nonpartisan voter turnout strategy that we have is high quality service delivery. So I'm curious if you can talk a little bit about as a former election administrator, sort of the explicit opportunities to make this linkage stronger and, you know, what what's going on in that space? Yeah, it's a great question. Look, I, this, this whole notion of trust, it just, you have to earn it. If anybody says, trust me, like you don't trust them, right? You trust somebody when they have earned your trust. And that means they you can depend on them to do the thing they said they were going to do at the time you needed it. Like, so that's why I constantly come back to this delivery thing. Um, you're talking about like when it comes to elections, uh, it, it, I, I frankly have always said elections are kind of a miracle from a just operations point of view. You think about all your customers could show up on one day. They're not all going to, but they could. They all expect that experience to be completely seamless. It's run by basically volunteers that used to be the average age was 72 in my state that get paid like, I don't know, $15 for, the, for, a, for a, you know, 16 hour day. Technology is changing all the time. People don't want to stand in line for more than 10 minutes and they expect the results to be done in 30 minutes, right? And it's just like, this is crazy. No one would ever run a business this way. You don't, you don't have something that's this important to be under invested in. And so I always say elections are a miracle. So one of the things I think we need to do on elections is we need to get more young people involved in sort of civic participation. We talk a lot about you know, user experience and, and, and citizens as customers, 
I think it's time for us to talk about citizens being citizens, right? Which is not just being dictated to and not just being seen as we're a customer and we deserve to be served, but we're citizens and we're, this is a thing that we have to participate in for it to work. And so um, that's my pitch as well for people who don't wanna come work at GSA or join the digital Corps, at least go volunteer and help in your elections. All right, unfortunately we are out of time. We'll be hanging around. We can do, all right, so we'll do one more question and it'll be easy, all right. Just uh, quickly, does the digital core support intelligence community? So a short answer is right now, no. It's not a blanket no for all of time. We're two years old as a program and in the grand scheme of the federal government that we're, we're pretty much still a newborn program. And we're in the, a great place of having more agencies want fellows than we have the capacity to support. And so that means we can actually be pretty picky and choosy when it comes to who we work with and making sure that they are best positioned to set our folks up for success. And one of the interesting things about the intelligence communities, they actually do a pretty good job on their own recruiting technology talent. They have a brand, they have a reputation, they're in the movies, whereas the GSA, um, for better or for worse, if anyone in Hollywood's listening, is not. And so they can recruit. They don't need necessarily us to, to be a front door into the work. And so often that's where the digital core can step in is folks actually apply centrally to the digital. Like a common app for government, you say, hey, I'm a designer. I'm a software engineer. These are my skills. We'll put you through a couple of rounds of vetting. And if you end up in our finalist pool, then we say, hey, let's take a look at your skills, your backgrounds, your experiences, and find who in our partners might be able to leverage that so that you can have the highest impact, which means you don't have to understand the org chart of government. You don't have to know the Health Resources and Services Administration and families is different from these other alphabet soup agencies, we can understand that for you and say, hey, we think your skills are really well suited for this project. And so we like to focus on that candidate experience. And again, I go to a lot of career fairs. I go to a lot of job fairs. Most federal government agencies might not be there, but the CIA is always there. <laughs> um, think about that. Um, <laughs> So thank you all for participating in this really important conversation. I have to say, going into 2024, especially having conversations like this about trust, bringing some of the best talent into work in organizations like the Digital Core is more important because if you don't have trust in government, then how are we going to tackle some of the challenges like healthcare and education and climate change? We need trust in government and trust in our institutions. So thank you all for coming. We'll be around for a couple more minutes and appreciate you.